It's my pleasure to welcome all the panelists and the audience to our panel discussion on queering commitment and reimagining love, family, and desire. This event is the first one this academic year, and as the graduating member, I can assure you that many like it will surely follow because we were a very capable and enthusiastic team this year. I invite everyone to keep in touch with us through our Facebook page where we'll post updates regarding the action that we take on campus as well as events such as this. So we will now introduce the stellar panel that we have today and the discussion will then commence. We will also open the floor for questions at the end of the discussion. Please use the raise hands feature on Zoom and mention whether your question is for any one particular panelist or for all of them. Sirbi. Thanks, Pusi. Um, Once again, I'm very sorry for the delays in beginning the event. I'm delighted to introduce the stellar panel that we have. Um, our first panelist and moderator is Dr. Akkai Padmashali, who is a social activist and the founder and director of On Day Day, an organization which works for women's rights, sexual minorities' rights, and the rights of children. They partner with the state and several community-based organizations to visibilize and engage with these movements. Dr. Akai is also a motivational speaker, a social worker, and a singer, and was the recipient of the Rajyot Sava Award, the second highest civilian honor of the government of Karnataka. Our next panelist is Mix Grace Banu, who is a transgender activist and the founder and director of Trans Rights Now Collective, a Dalit, Bahujan, and Adivasi centered organization of trans folks. They work towards greater visibility of the movements. They work towards visibilizing these movements and, um, for, and working towards increasing opportunity for the trans folks in workplace, education, and politics. They are also involved in mobilization and advocacy around the amendment to the Transgender Persons Bill 2019. Our next panelist is Mix Vikwira Maditya Sahai. Mix Vikwiram is an associate at the Center for Law and Policy Research in Bangalore. They, have, they hold a postgraduate degree in political science from the University of Delhi. They have previously been in, they have previously worked as a faculty at the gender at the gender studies department of the Ambedkar University in Delhi, and have also served as a consultant to the Tata Institute of Social Sciences Bombay's Advanced Center for Women's Studies. Our next panelist is Professor Madhavi Menon, who is a director of the Center for Studies in Gender and Sexuality at the Ashoka University. She teaches queer theory, politics of desire and identity, Renaissance literature, and Shakespearean works. She has authored and edited several books on queer politics and literature, and her most recent book is titled Infinite Variety, A History of Desire, in India. Our final panelist is Mr. Danish Sheikh. Mr. Sheikh is a PhD candidate at the Melbourne Law School and a member of the Institute of International Law and the Humanities. His research is centered on the intersections of law, literature, and performance, drawing upon his experiences as an activist lawyer and a theater practitioner. He has previously worked with the Alternate Law Forum, the International Commission of Jurists, as an associate professor at the Jindal Global Law School, and has also served as a consultant to the United Nations Development Programs Project on legal gender and legal recognition of gender across various Asian countries. Once again, a very warm welcome to this one eclectic and expert panel. And Dr. Akai, I now hand over to you for the rest of the session. Thank you, Zurbi. Yeah. Um, I don't want to take much time and I want to say hello to all my friends and fellow panelists. Hi, Danish. <laughs> hi, Madhavi. Hi, Vikram sir. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Grace. Is Grace online? Hi, Akai. Hi, Grace, you are there? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Yeah. How are you in Corona times? Uh, <laughs> corona think... time, I'm running around the yeah. villages. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm having yeah. so many meetings with the yeah. government office. So I want to welcome you as a moderator for the panel, and uh, please feel feel free, feel comfortable. Please express your opinion. Your opinion is totally respected under the intolerant government, under the you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, where the space is totally you know like legitimizing for especially for minorities, vulnerable communities. marginalized sections and the minority section in the country with this i want to definitely go to the topic that we are talking today is that creating commitment reimagining love family and desire i think i wanted to start with uh, you know grace you know uh, grace please take your time and ensure you are you know like you'll be having 9 to 10 minutes at the 9 minutes i just ping you yeah yeah okay so you I think we'll start. You can go ahead. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. Hello. Hi Grace. Yeah, we can hear Hi. you. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Hello. 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 Hi Grace. Hello. So, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Here it's it's raining. So I think my voice is clear or not? It is very clear. You please go ahead. Okay, great. So the querying uh, things, love, family, and uh, I want to take it this uh, from the family. You know, the most of the queer people we are facing the discrimination within the family structure. So family and romance, we don't have a a uh, space to express our feelings and the uh, family also uh, uh, giving so much discrimination and now the covid situation we had a uh, uh, we are having uh, so much trans uh, the queer people or uh, murders are happening you know like Uh, i know uh, in tamil nadu uh, we are uh, the, the this pandemic time we got four trans uh, women so uh, committed suicide so because of uh, the love and the family discrimination you know the the uh, the most of the youngsters are uh, facing the discrimination within the family structure so the family structure having so much issues so we need to change the family uh, acceptance and so we need the family acceptance is a must so we are all fighting for that and the uh, but the discrimination is happening uh still uh, it's 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 going on so and the love love means uh a person all the people all the people are animal all all are having a love so the people who have the humanity so that humanity people have the feeling love it's a feeling like ya uh hungry uh, or uh ya yeah, heat this kind of feelings the same feelings it's a love but the society uh, having some hierarchy structure they are following that structure so they are doing 
against the love. So they they are they they impose their thoughts, they impose their caste patriarchy thoughts, they impose their uh, yeah racial thoughts in that uh, the minority community. So being a queer, we don't we we have a love. We are we are having all kind of feelings. So we have a love with our parents. We have a love with our uh, a partner, we have a love with a uh, society. So this kind of love, love is everywhere. So, but this civil society love, the civil society kind of love, it's having a yeah, caste, uh, race, and the sex. So we have to fight with this uh, structure you know love doesn't have uh, any uh, gender love doesn't have any caste love doesn't have any uh, uh, the race so we have to uh, change the love is love that's it so love is uh, having any body so, a body who are, who have all kind of feelings, the body who have uh, that having uh, so much feelings. So include that feelings. Love is also a part of that. But uh, we had so much experience. Love. Uh, now the nowadays we got a corner killing. So a lot of honor killing is happening and a lot of uh, 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 the queer community murders are happening. For example, that Devika case, the uh, uh, queer person in Kerala who committed suicide because of the family discrimination. And uh, so many cases we have. So all the cases are anxious, the family and the love, they, that, that both have, yeah, strong bond. So love uh, doesn't have any kind of differentiality. You know, the, the society had different, uh, but the family have all kind of differentiation. The family structure, has. the family have a patriarchy thought, the family have a cost structure. So we have to change we have to fight we are fighting for that rights we have, we are fighting for uh, to change the people's mindset so now the acceptance it's happened but rights it's not happened so now uh, we are demanding our rights the marriage rights marriage rights so the my uh, friend, my folk, uh, the Dr. Rakai Patmasali, who got married a cis man, and that marriage is registered. So the so who's she's the first trans uh, women who registered their uh, uh, marriage. Before that, we don't have a rights to recognize our marriage, to, uh, to accept our marriage system. So according to uh, the, the same thing it's happened to in, in Tamil Nadu, we had a, a case in uh, Arun Kumar and Srija case. So uh, that, uh, they, that both couple uh, uh, got a judgment. Uh, through the Madras High Court judgments, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they, married, they got married, but still now they don't get a, uh, they didn't get a marriage certificate. So th their marriage are enrolled, but uh, they, uh, the certificate is not provided. So this kind of, the, the lack of accessibility, the lack of uh, 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 implementation, it's uh, not, uh, in the society. So 
and i have to give another same example a, a trans woman and a cis man they both are married in the uh, uh, kadalur district and they both are committed suicide last month because of that that their both parent side they don't accept their love and they are uh, they don't uh, they didn't like their uh, their uh, they, they didn't accept their love and they didn't accept their marriage and they didn't accept okay this both people are having a feelings life is their decision but the family uh, get so much threatened to the those, those those two people and those two people are committed suicide so the reality have been this kind of experience so that the loss should be a strong not like uh, the transgender protection law act it's not an act okay so we need to a uh, form a strong law we need to create a secure uh, create the people uh, who are minority the queer community needs to a uh, secure law protection uh, because of uh, you know the lot of honor killing are happened and this kind of so this this is also a killing so this is also a murder yeah both uh, families does not accept their love and feelings uh, they committed suicide but i'm saying it's not a suicide it's a murder so the being a society we have a responsibility to recognize a person a human as a human so each and every uh, the humanity the people who are having a human being so they all have love so they all have a rights but this rights it it's it's it didn't provide so we have to fight we are with to get a uh rights uh for the people and we have a responsibility to create a safety environment for a for a community thank you hello okay can you hear me thanks much grace okay great yeah thank you so much for your um, expression i should say that i need to endorse what you said the family is you know uh, don't have a space for expression and we are totally facing discrimination on the grounds of your identity and sexual orientation and because of your class and because of your region and because of your background that you come from and second thing when you are quoting about love i think i think the word you mentioned was honor killing i think it's not honor we need to say that it's a dishonor killing you know if someone is going to kill us yes. we need to question back what it is it's killing. not a honor yeah 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 thank you grace for uh, and uh, you know for your flight or your, uh, you know for your flow of light that you are bringing before us thank you so much yeah and uh, i want to move on to uh, aditya sahai you know my love my uh, good friend uh, please go ahead it's your time uh if i could actually request uh, there's a uh, i just have a policy of not speaking before dalit and muslim and adivasi people so i would request if danish doesn't mind very much that danish go second and i could go third is that possible um yeah that, yeah i'm i'm fine with that yeah yeah i respect that thank you mm-hmm. hi danish yeah um okay um hi everyone hi it's nice to see you okay welcome please um 
So I am um, just going to start by acknowledging that I'm seated in the library of the Institute of Postcolonial Studies in Melbourne. Um, and I acknowledge that the place where I sit on um, sits on stolen customary lands of the Wurundjeri people. And as a visitor to this land, I pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and future. So I'm going to just start by telling you that my own thoughts on this question are really fractured and I don't quite have a crystallized opinion. I do have questions which I'm going to try and formulate for you um, and formulate with you maybe right here and these are just invitations to maybe think together. So I'm literally calling them questions. So first is the subject question. So Patricia Williams tells us that subject position is everything when we talk about law. And so as far as I am concerned, um, I am a gay man. I have never been married. I'm presently based in Melbourne in a jurisdiction where state recognized same sex marriage has been in place since 2017. Uh, do I have a desire to access the institution of marriage? Yes, I would be lying if I said otherwise. Um, do I struggle with this desire because I think that perhaps marriage by itself doesn't mean anything for me and that this might also just be a desire for the power and privilege that comes with access to this form of legitimation? Sure, yes. Um, is this a completely theoretical question right now? 100% yes. Okay, so that's just the, the subject question. Um, second, um, as I call it, the law question. So given that part of this discussion is prompted by a petition to recognize same-sex marriage in India, uh, the question then is how do we describe practices of performing same-sex slash queer marriage that have existed prior to this moment in India? Can we understand these uh, dissident marriages as lawful? So as an example, back in 1987, Urmila Srivastava and Leela Namdeo, two women from a rural background serving in the Madhya Pradesh constabulary, decide to get married at a temple. All right, this is 1987. So they are then dismissed from their workspace and they're warned against returning. Now, this is an early narrative, but you hear a number of stories like this over the years. Um, and, and, and I think Grace has indicated some of those stories as well. So we can see the story and we can see those other stories like isolated social practices, or we can understand these moments maybe as moments that, that generate law, that create law, that forge a certain relationship with law. And so for us then, as people who work with or against state law, the question might be to try and find ways of describing these other moments as lawful, not lawless, and try and understand what law it is that they generate, if not state law. Um, third is what I call the love question. So how do we hold love and marriage together in the same frame? So when we say, forget everything else, marriage is about the state recognizing love. Now the queer theorist Michael Warner tells us that there is a certain slippage in this argument. And the slippage occurs because love belongs to what he calls an antinomian tradition. So the notion of love is that it is validated by the other and the lovers form a discrete unit that gives legitimacy to each other. But when you talk about marriage, you're turning away from that relationship between the lovers and you're asking a third party, which is the state to recognize the relationship. So when you do that, it becomes a different kind of question. So in that sense, putting love and legal marriage, they kind of become at odds with each other. Um, fourth. Um, the queer question. So marriage is linked to form. It has a structure. It has defined rituals of entry. It has defined rituals of exit. It is in every sense of the word an institution. How do you queer an institution? Because queerness by its nature is this constantly expanding horizon. You know, it's non-normative, it's boundless. Um, so Jose Monoz, who's a queer theorist says we can never actually reach queerness. We can never actually touch it. We can feel it as an illumination from a distant horizon. So what does it mean to try and queer marriage if we wanted to do that? How do you detach it from 
its moorings, which we do acknowledge as patriarchal or heteronormative. So something like an open marriage is still a marriage, just with different rules. Um, a same-sex marriage is still a marriage, just with different barriers to access. Or if you want to reframe that, so a sex-neutral marriage is still a marriage, but with ba different barriers to access. So what does queering even look like? Is this even a possibility when it comes to marriage? Um, fifth, the strategic slash pragmatic question. So instrumentally, could marriage mean something? Just at, at the very pragmatic level, could it provide a sense of protection and support to queer persons? So in an essay by Priya Tangaraja and Ponya Arasu, they talk about the ways that the writ of habeas corpus is often misused by families of runaway queer couples. Women um, in these cases. So you have the women captured and then produced before a court of law, after which the judge is persuaded uh, to return the person to their family. Now, in the case of heterosexual couples, we found that it's the case that marriage is one of the strongest tools against the use of habeas corpus. So we know that the judge, when faced with a married couple, is reluctant to break that bond to pacify the family. And in these cases, it's pretty much always the woman's family. So we can't escape the fact that what's happening is still rooted in a patriarchal frame. Right? So marriage simply changes who the judge observes the woman as belonging to, but it still seems to provide you a measure of protection here. Uh, there's another point related to this point, which I would call a question of legal form. So if we were to have this conversation about same-sex marriage, uh, and again, sorry, maybe it's more useful to call it sex-neutral marriage, um, what is the analog that we do have to existing legal structures? So how do you think about even starting to talk about a law that offers protection that doesn't place a new kind of onerous burden? So if you take the example of the Special Marriage Act, which I think would be the closest analog. So in Parvez Modi's uh, ethnography of love marriage in Delhi, she talks about how with the Special Marriage Act, uh, you have individuals across faiths who can enter the institution without giving up their religion. Um, but in its structure and its operation, the Special Marriage Act serves to make interfaith marriage a vastly more difficult and conflict-ridden enterprise. So in, in the study that she does, Pervez Modi shows us how um, this, the, spe the, the Special Marriage Act has this 30-day notice requirement, which eventually results in a couple's residential address being publicly displayed outside the magistrate's office. And that's often misused by groups who engage in immoral policing to then notify um, um, the couple's uh, family in different kinds of ways. So in many instances where couples have escaped the households and attempted to use the institution of marriage to counter persecution from their families, the architecture and implementation of the law has largely acted against their interests. So if you just have a poorly crafted state law in instances like this, it's the opposite of a shield. And my sixth and final point, I'll just come back to this querying commitment question. So this loops back to your title. So if we really wanted to take that phrase seriously, the idea of querying commitment, what, what would that look like? So there's this line by Dean Spade that captures an element of this idea really well. Um, and he says, uh, they, they say, well, what would it mean to treat our friends more like lovers and our lovers more like friends? So would it perhaps ask us to start by expanding the frame of commitment by imagining relational intimacy as delinked from sex or as separate from sex? Um, and what would it look like to make commitments to and with, for example, our friends? If commitment is about stability and if the things that we want from marriage are rooted in material security, then what does it mean for those of us I'll come back to find... Sorry? Who find that our um, friendships are our most stable relationships. Um, what would it look like to try and bring in contractual commitments into these spaces if you want to try and imagine other ways of lawfully living together? So yeah, so I'll just stop at the sixth point and then, um, yeah, thank you. Danish, thank you. Thank you. I think that was really, you know, opening our eyes and hearts to rethink what exactly is, you know, the marriage, love and desire that we are talking about and reimagining what is this querying commitment. Yeah. 
So now can we come back to uh, Aditya Sahai? Is it okay? Yeah. Thanks, Akai. Um, and thanks uh, to both Grace uh, and uh, for Danish for gracefully accepting my proposal. Um, uh, at the outset, uh, let me say that one thing I would ask of Grace, because she spoke really uh, quickly, is that she eventually come to uh, what is currently occupying her, that she is actually building a living community with 50 other trans women uh, working with the state to build this. And it's an amazing project and she's too shy to talk about how great she is. But we will not shy away from asking her to be a little more explicit with her greatness. So, um, so maybe in the Q&A. Um, so quickly then, um, I'm generally uh, not a person who would like to be put in a reactive position because two, two lawyers sat in Oxford Union and decided that they're going to talk about gay marriage is not why I'm going to talk about gay marriage. Um, and in any case, uh, as both Grace and Danish have told us that there are various forms of queer marriages uh, already available. So it's sad to people who sit in Oxford Union and don't do their research at home. Uh, that the marriage laws in this country are actually quite capable of holding something like gay marriage. So I welcome their accumulation of cultural capital, uh, but uh, it's really something that we already have. Um, uh, it's also to mark really quickly that marriages have taken various forms in history, marriages and families. Uh, we have, and uh, we continue to not actually have the idea of marriage as you see in North India uh, sitting in Delhi may not be what marriage takes, ma the only form that marriage takes. Marriage doesn't always also take a relationship between uh, a person and another person. It can take uh, it can take the form of what we have as the Devdasi tradition and so on and so forth. Complicated as that may be, I just want to point to various forms of kinship that exist in the social, including the gharana and so on and so forth. Which means that marriages have always changed and I would not uh, close off that question. Uh, which also means uh, that uh, I'm okay with the right to marry so long as there is a right to divorce. Uh, and uh, as long as that is available, I'm perfectly fine with whatever forms of kinship they come up with. Uh, unfortunately, we think of right to mar the marriage question as closing off with the question of access and not with questions of exiting. Uh, and I would, uh, and we really need to kind of think of those questions. And again, with the question of marriage come questions of property, honor, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I tried listing the name of everyone we've lost to an honor killing this year. And the list was too long for me to take and would have taken up all the minutes that I had. So I refused, I didn't do that. So I look forward to the honor killing of gays uh, really soon. Um, so then uh, what I therefore uh, want to mark really quickly uh, is that uh, the rights discourse is actually an insufficient discourse because those who have to ask for their rights are already in some sense without them. Uh, and so therefore rights uh, by themselves and in of themselves are a practice of humiliation, a practice of stigmatizing, a practice of marginalization. Uh, to speak of rights is of course to be at the mercy of someone who will give them to them give them to you and to in some sense already be disenfranchised uh, and to not have to resort to rights as part of entitlement uh, is a form of dehumanization. Um, so I feel like we're in a kind of between the devil and the deep sea there. Um, and I, I also therefore want to think uh, really quickly about queerness and its relation to rights, uh, the right to marry. Uh, now we must actually also historicize the fact that queerness is burden of producing other forms of sociality through sexuality only show up uh, in the Euro US context uh, where a deep individuation was part of the process and the project of freedom. Uh, this is why, uh, because in some sense, uh, classic work by say John DeMario on capitalism and gay identity, it is precisely because people were made lonely by the industrial revolution and thereafter uh, the formation of uh, the nuclear individual uh, in some sense by state practices and law that people had to resort to sexuality as the moment of sociality and kinship, right? Uh, this, uh, of course, does not actually happen here. As we know that kinship here is fractured by religion, by caste, by ability, and so on and so forth. And so a conversation on rethinking kinship, desire, and love will have to actually move away from the Euro-American context where it sets up an individual 
as the rights bearing subject that will then seek sex that, that will use sexuality in order to move outside of oneself um there are many queer theorists who actually uh, can be used around this um so then quickly to actually what i wanted to say uh is uh, that i uh, i want to actually think about this idea of commitment um really quickly uh so what is commitment uh is commitment a promise is it a contract uh the other way in which we use commitment is um to commit someone to an institution so to an asylum or to the prison uh and of course we no longer commit suicide we die by them so uh and perhaps that's the proximity between marriage and law um uh so then i want to think about uh what forms of love and family and desire are animated by commitment are animated by a promise a performative gesture um say performed as uh, danish said in front of an audience that could be the state it could be the church and so on and so forth uh, a contract which is a form of enslavement because at heart what a contract again to go back to patricia williams what a contract does is make the parties subservient to the contract rather than to themselves um and so contracts are a form of enslavement and uh, whether it is to commit to an institution whether an asylum a home or a, a or custody and therefore what forms of love family and desire are in, animated by incarceration so then uh, what animates commitment is it equal parts trust and mistrust that you want to invoke the law is it equal parts anxiety and structure is it equal parts envy and capacity is it equal parts fear and overcoming what if we desire or commit to the commit desire to commit or commit to love family and desire because we cannot actually live with our own desire for freedom and therefore what kind of protection is right if it can only be encountered in a moment of loss um and this i feel is really important because i feel like what the conversation on some of these things in a rights based discourse does is that it encapsulates conversations and relations into one thing so is it possible that i ask instead that my relation with my mother i uh, be one that could be queered what would it mean for us to seek freedom in this relation is there a subject that can be freed from a bond can i force a person out out of my mother what is the afterlife of a contract this between maternal and child or say the con any other contract what is the afterlife of slavery as saidi hatman would ask since emancipation and contract is slavery by other means and therefore we must ask what is there a possibility as a uh, of a recovery baths has a has a lovely moment uh, by which they begin camera lucida where they're looking at their photograph of their mother uh before uh they came to know her and they're trying to recover a subject outside of it in a moment of mourning and one wonders therefore the whole project of camera lucida and mourning diary of can a mother be recovered from something apart uh, as apart from what she is to us uh therefore a uh, queering commitment itself is actually an anxiety about the future uh and the future itself is an anxiety of the young uh many years ago i had uh, had uh, organized a conversation at dadi queer fest uh about looking at the same conversation through the act of aging uh because sexuality in some sense and queer politics itself fetishizes the young as its subject and imagines sexuality by centering them as it does the able bodied and so on from cruising and so on and so forth so what so then if actually sexuality is futural uh and queering commitment is one of a right to marry to come that is we will offer the right to marry and so if if one of us gets married then other people in the future will have marriage what does it offer to the past what does it offer to those who are who we are not married to and therefore what does it offer to our mothers and grandmothers i also therefore really want to quickly uh ask the question uh of uh love uh and therefore and i'm very skeptical of love not so much in that queer kind of uh, moment where it kind of depoliticizes the radical impulse of sexuality kind of rubbish but i'm actually i'm actually worried about the righteousness at the heart of love and something like trust 
and I'm worried about uh, its grandness. Uh, yeah, so then what would non-grand, non-righteous feelings uh, look like and what would commitment look like were we to center, say, adoration or what Toni Morrison calls regard? Uh, and therefore, what doesn't have the license of desire? That is, you can do anything. You desire anyone, you can like do whatever you feel like. Uh, does it have relation? And Grisson points it out for us. Or is even sex the, uh, the opposite of desire? What doesn't have the privacy of intimacy? Proximity, thoughtfulness, regard. What doesn't have the pin codes of queerness? And pin code is a term that Dhruva Jyoti uh, uses uh, to refer to the ways in which queer people continue to circulate with people who they went to school with, live in the same residential colony, and share cultural resources with. And queerness, as we see, especially uh, as the Dalit queer work in the world can show us, is precisely about the circulation of the spin code, right? So it's a year preferred or whatever, right? Queer ma and you know that marriages in India, if they were to be queer, would still be arranged. Uh, I doubt that it will come to love marriages anytime soon. Uh, so then is, is, the, is the opposite of spin codes of queerness a uh, generous hosp stranger hospitality? Is it abolition itself? And therefore, instead of the beauty of love, trust, and commitment, can ugliness be a place to begin? Can commitment begin not from love and desire, but from envy and abandonment that lead us to love and desire? And who will commit to this ugliness and abandonment? And who will therefore stay with us? On those notes, I'll close my address. Thank you. Thanks, Vikram. Hello. Hello. I can hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I think what Aditya Sahai has really raised the fundamental questions. Uh, of what is this love? Is this commitment we are talking about? Contract. I think the core principles or the core values that we're talking about is from the context of marriage. I think many questions need to be answered on some of them, you know, whether you get answer or not, that is secondary, but still, it is there in your life or in your life to think through your journey of uh, activism that we are going through as a movement and the community, you know. With this, I also wanted to uh, invite my friend, Madhavi Menon, so please share your own opinion. Yeah. Thank you, Akai. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, on this panel and in the audience. Thank you to Survi for inviting all of us and for putting together this panel. It's a real honor to be in conversation with all of you. I'd like to begin with an apology. I had no idea that we were going to speak for eight to nine minutes at the beginning. So I have prepared nothing. In fact, I, it was a great shock to me when uh, Akai announced this at the beginning. And I'm just so grateful that I'm going last because I really had nothing prepared. And since we're running short of time, I'm going to be very brief um, and maybe just touch on a couple of things. And then uh, hopefully we can go into them in the, in the Q&A. Um, I just want, to say, uh, just want to say a couple of things. One is that I am um, uh, surprised, shocked, horrified, whichever degree of, of horror one wants to attach to it at the way in which people seem to want to get married. I have always been horrified by marriage uh, and I continue to be right now because it has always seemed to me uh, from a very early age on as nothing but a ploy of the state to try and control what I do with my body and what I do with my life. And uh, all the sort of conversations around marriage have to, as Grace has so wonderfully shown at the beginning, have to do with a conversation with the state. It has to do with this idea of certification. It has to do with this idea of registration. Uh, you can get married without registering your marriage, of course, but if you want any rights accruing from marriage to accrue to you, then you actually have to get it registered. You have to get it certified. So there is absolutely no marriage without the intervention of the state, which is to say, the entire sort of sentimentalizing apparatus we have around marriage, uh, which the word love captures so uh, entirely and again so problematically for me, um, is not about love at all. If by love we understand 
uh, interpersonal intimacy between two people. That's my first problem. Love is always about a couple. Um, if we understand love about intimacy between two people, there is no intimacy between two people without it's being certified, as Dinesh said, by a third party. And in this case, that third party is the one that allows you, as um, Vikram said so well, retrospectively to then claim your status as someone in love. So love becomes a sort of sentimentalizing narrative that we tell ourselves, oh, this is why we want to get married. Um, in fact, the entire marriage project uh, the entire sort of aftermath of 377 in the Supreme Court has all been about love. Uh, one remembers Vikram Seth's uh, cover story in India today, for instance, uh, when he says, I'm being criminalized for love. Um, and, and the sort of um, normative pressure to fall in love, to be in love, to love someone, I think is enormous. And of course, the word that completely falls out of this entire vocabulary, and I just find it interesting, that falls completely out of this entire vocabulary is sex. Um, and, and a lot of people have made this critique already that uh, the minute you start fetishizing love, the minute you start fetishizing privacy, the minute you start fetishizing commitment and registration and certification by the state, what you are automatically doing is drawing a line that has been drawn many, many, many times before that leaves out, for instance, prostitutes, out, for instance, anybody who indulges in public sex, that leaves out, for instance, people who do not want to fall in love, but who want to have plenty of sex, for example. And this, of course, leads me to think about what the problem is with the rights-based discourse. And let me begin by saying, again, I completely sympathize with and this was what Grace was saying at the beginning again, I completely sympathize with, and I think it is absolutely crucial to signal one's support for the fact that no one should be at the receiving end of violence. We also have to remember that a large portion of that violence, especially in the country in which we live, comes from the state. And so if we are thinking about rights as a protection for us provided by the state, we are being naive because that is allowing us or forcing us to turn a blind eye to all the violence and rights violation that happens by the state. So that is sort of one thing we need to keep in mind. The second thing about rights that I find problematic is that by definition, a right is always have to be contrasted with, always have to be, has to be opposed to a wrong. So the minute you say, I want a right, you are implicitly or explicitly saying, I want a right that X, Y, and Z cannot and will not and should not have. So it's always a moralistic process. It's always a, a sort of a one upmanship of saying, I want this, but I'm gonna close the door behind me so that no one else can get in. Marriage to my mind is that discourse par excellence. That marriage is all about, give me the right to get married, and we can think about the other people later. Um, a lot of lawyers tell me that this is a very good strategic program because if you win one set of right to marriage right now, it'll come for other people later. Um, and I sort of want to point out to them, yes, but you're still working with the assumption that marriage is the be all and end all and the bedrock for all kinds of rights. Uh, whereas of course, it very much depends on the outlawing of rights on not giving certain constituencies rights on the basis of which you will get them. Um, and so the idea of marriage and the idea of queerness for me uh, are completely antithetical to one another. Um, I think sort of fighting for gay marriage in the United States was an absolute waste of capital that had been built up for decades and in really interesting and radical ways. Um, and I fear we are headed in the same direction when the need for the hour is to build solidarities among marginalized people is to build solidarities among oppressed minority groups rather than saying, oh, please let me, please, please allow me to join the normative majority, which is creating havoc for the rest of the world. Um, and let's forget about the minorities, which is where we really belong. Um, so I'll stop there, um, Akai, but of course I'm happy to speak more during our discussion or the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Madhavi. I respect horrifying expression that you really placed. Uh, yeah, I think we have uh, 25 minutes more. I'll be, I'll be talking uh, maybe five to six minutes. Then we'll go for question answers. 
I think uh, I think whatever you all were trying to say or trying to express your opinion, I think that's totally respected and that needs to be in this platform. But my uh, thing that the whole program was organized by the National Law School of India University's Feminist Alliance, really the feminist movement in the country, the women's movement in the country are really thinking broad in its perspectives. How do we include the issues of be it the transgender, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersex, Jogapa, Marla, Deshu, Shakti, you know, and plus identities within its realm to for discussion and discourse. In the country that the so far, the judgment which has come from the Supreme Court of 2014 and 2018 verdicts has really brought, you know, so high positive response in the movement, very particularly I'm talking about because of the feminist and the women's rights movement was through with the sexual minority community movement to support our larger issues who we are combating daily in our lives be it our fundamental rights be it our constitutional rights and be it our you know all other civil rights are concerned i think thank you so much for national law school for you know, for, you know the, the you know like the feminist alliance for organizing and bringing us all of uh, you know like us together and especially making me as a moderator as you know building so much of responsibility and I want to share my perspective of love, family, and desire. I think, uh, very frankly talking, forget what the state wants. Forget what the society wants. We need to live for ourselves. When I say we need to live for ourselves, it's a political stand that I'm taking, you know, for me and by me and for what I'm talking for today. Why I say this, as a transgender person, being in street, as sex worker, as beggar, and from a very working class, non-English speaking background, I feel and see so much of hurdles, challenges, battles that still today going through. What Grace Banu said, I'm Dr. Akkai Padmajali, forget doctorate, just start talk as a common human being within amongst the life that we are living in this larger society, which is challenging. I think from day one, when you express your identity, your feelings, expression, till you die, I think you are in such a hurdle that you need to combat people. You, you, know, you, you, know, you need to fight with people for acceptance, for find your own love, for your find, you know, to find your space to live the way you want it to be. With that, all of this, I also wanted to say that be yourself and be, I know, like, and let's be ourselves. Let's not bother about others. I say with so much of uh, guts and power because society has a problem and so said, you can't justify society for each and every aspect of it. What the social expected norms, which are patriarchal, which are power ruled, you know, societies who are making us to follow a certain amount of rules and regulation, where we need to fight against this and we need to agitate all of these odds. In the same way, the Transgender Persons Act, which was passed in the parliament, and now again, there is some amount of deadline, I think by end of this month, we need to submit our you know, opinion for the uh, act. I think this is showing how state is so reluctant, you know, and definitely state is not bothering about what exactly we as a movement, we as a community wants, and still the state is bringing its notion, which is something dangerous. I think that's dangerous for democracy. And I speak democracy means it's a consultative process. And the government has not done this consultative process, except with this elite, transgender people who are being part of favoring the government, talking the politics of government and supporting the notion of demonetization, supporting the notion of intolerance, supporting the notion of horse riding to rule the state in the name of constitutionality. With all of this, I also just wanted to say that without we addressing the issues of class, caste, religion, discrimination, in a social exclusion within the realm that we are, today we are talking about love, family, and desire. There is no love, family, desire without addressing the issues what I just said. And what is love? I think love is something that called, it's an unspoken, you know, it's an unspoken terminology. It's a, you know, like it's an unspoken word which has not been spoken in any of the sector that we are living, except in the, you know, like in the last 20th and 21st century, people are slowly trying to push what is this love about, you know? Is it love between two cis, you know, uh, sex or cis women body? Or talking about opposite sex? Or talking about same sex? Talking about love between human beings, between animals, between, you know, species, etc. And who defines love, you know? I think that's a big question always, it comes to me. 
you know, like again to going back to saying that love is a big question to all of us. They, if you are going to, you know, like raise in love with someone that you're affected to or you're wanting to live for a long time, I know, like even for a second, for a minute, you know, like love has no definition. In the same way, there is, if, you know, like in intercaste marriages or, in, you know, like an intercaste living relationship, how does this love plays a vital role in judging and deciding people? You know, with this, I also want to say that in my own experience, I think now the situation in the country we are living, the two Supreme Court verdicts of 2014 and 2018 have spoken based on the grounds of constitution morality. I think as a movement, as a sexual minorities movement, we are in a situation, how do we transfer the constitution morality into the public morality? When I say public morality, that means how do you transfer the judgment language to your families, to education institutions, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your, you know, to your, you know, like, to your you know, like relatives, to your you know, siblings, to your lovers, to your you know, partners, whoever it could be. I think even the state is not in a situation to openly think what is this love that we are talking about from the context of sexual minority community. My own journey of you know, choosing love, family and desire, I think love something comes from even whenever you know, like indulging in sex work and begging, I think love it automatically comes when you are attracted to some person. You know? I think that's what I you know, like define my love. But family is something that is a challenging question. Family is a patriarchal institution. Family is a power ruled institution. But how do you define family for yourself? Are you going to construct your own family? Are you going to reimagine your own family from the feminist point of view? Are you going to talk family perspective means, yes, inclusion is the main agenda of the family? I think it is challenging as a person who got married to a cis man. You know, my almost my eight to 10 years of love has been extended to, you know, like marriage and the marriage was supported by both patriarchal, you know, institutions of marriage, be it from my parents' side and be it from my husband's side, you know. With that, marriage is not so, you know, like so easy to swim. There is so much of expectations. There is so much of, you know, hierarchy. There is so much of power. I think whatever the, you know, like you and your partner may be in the, you know, like in the track of marriage, but outside the track, there are people who are judging your marriage it is not the question of your transgender identity. It is not the question of your, you know, cis women identity. It's not the question of your gay, lesbian identity. It's a question of human identity. So how do you question back the larger society? Talking about your desire aspect, desire and dream that we need to desire for, you know, for long term. And, you know, like, you know, like let the desire come through in all our lives. That's what I wanted to say to all of us, you know. And uh, thank you so much for being and joining this panel. I think now, Surubi, we need to go for question and answers. Anyone who wants to ask questions, please feel free. And, you know, yeah, and let your questions be directed to people. And please mention the names and ask questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Akai. Uh, so I have a question on the chat for Professor Menon. Could you please elaborate on why you believe that the fight for marriage equality in the United States was a waste of social capital? Um, thank you. Thank you, Surbhi. Thank you to uh, whoever asked that question. Um, I think it was a waste of political capital. And I I hope that's the word I used. If I didn't, uh, I, I revised myself. I think it was a waste of political capital because the um, if you just sort of think about the early slogans of the um, queer activist movement uh, early on in the US, uh, there were sort of radical things like don't assume anything. Uh, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Um, and to sort of domesticate that kind of rage, to domesticate that kind of anger into, will you please, please, please let me wear whatever it is I want to wear, a white fluffy dress, 
and spend inordinate amounts of money getting married to someone I love just seems to me a shocking uh, crash and burn of a certain kind of political edge that queerness uh, really must be able to um, wield as a sword and as a weapon. Um, and so for me, the, the sort of similar loss would be here in India, if the so-called marriage project, if the so-called ideas uh, for marriage took a similar turn of replacing um, a lot of the edginess, a lot of what I called alliance building that we saw, for instance, in a Shaheen Bagh, uh, which was exhilarating for two to three months, starting November last year before everything was shut down uh, in March. That, that sense of sort of solidarity where we're talking about um, oppressions and we're talking about oppressions across religious, caste, class, and gendered lines. We're talking about the absolutely oppressive institutions of patriarchy of which marriage is foremost. And to sort of say, I'm going to owe my position in the world to a certain kind of resistance to patriarchy on the one hand. Because for anyone to be queer is automatically to step outside the norms of a certain kind of heterosexual patriarchy that they have been taught to uh, inhabit as they grow up. So to say on the one hand that I owe my existence in the world to a critique of patriarchy and then to fall right into that trap and say, and I want to uphold the very thing that gives patriarchy its power, to me, that is a great dilemma. To me, that is simply not um, something that fits well or sits well for me. Thank you, Professor. We have a couple of people who have raised their hands. And post that, we have a couple of questions on private chat and chat to everyone. But just before that, I'd like to tell, you, tell everyone that Mix Grace has disconnected because of internet issues and they're trying to reconnect as soon as they can. So, Brie, can you be a bit louder? Sorry, maybe our connection. Oh, but... I'm so sorry. No, I'm, I'm sure it was me. I'm so sorry. Uh, Mix Grace has disconnected because of internet issues. Um, but we do have a couple of participants who have raised their hands and also questions on private chat. So after individuals who have raised their hands are done, I'll post the questions on chat to you all. Thank you. Um, Keta and Smriti and Jasmine, please feel free to ask your questions to the panelists directly. Hello, am I audible? Hello? Y yes, yeah. you are. Okay, yeah, so I didn't know we could um, ask directly, so I posted my question on the chat. But anyway, my question is for uh, Professor Menon and Vikram. And I wanted to, um, and I wanted to uh, ask you what the relationship between desire and death is. And I ask this because we touched upon the question of death um, with regards to dishonor, honor killing, suicide, etc. And I was wondering, as uh, Professor Menon, you point out in your book, can suicide not just be seen as a lack of agency, but a statement as a reclaiming of agency, as a way of saying, um, we will not let our desires be policed. And I wonder how we can draw a parallel to victim your uh, uh, recent work about uh, and sort of post about sort of uh, desire leading to that which kills desire as something triggering a uh, kind of a policing. And I just thought we could, if we could like talk about that a little bit. So it would be best to collect a bunch of questions in the interest of time. Um, could I ask a question for Vikram? Yes, please go ahead. You don't need you don't need to ask me. Okay, uh, Vikram, hi. Thank you so much for the talk, and I just wanted to uh, ask you that you've been writing about abolished desire a lot recently. Do you elaborate on that a little bit? You're on mute. Okay. Hi, my question is for uh, Madhavi ma'am and uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry for the disturbance. I you had basically spoken about how uh, rights were exclusionary in nature, in the sense that when you're giving somebody a right, you're taking it away from someone else, and uh, this sounded very similar to me with respect to what the critical legal scholars had put up during their movement which began in the united states and there was a lot of criticism with regards to that being a very elitist standpoint because rights uh, were played a very important role in the civil rights movement to uh, kind of bring uh, the uh, blacks to the same level as the whites so how do you think this can be combated and if do you if you think this is a valid criticism uh, i think uh, vikram what do you think why don't we just sort of address these couple of questions at least otherwise we'll just forget do you want to go ahead your mic is open go first okay um just a couple of things thank you by the way uh, both of you for your for your questions um ketan and I, i don't know the second questioner's name but thank you um the idea yes i do think that death can be read in multiple ways i do think death need not necessarily be seen as the end of the road um i do think death can be an assertion of some kind um and i think it is sort of extremely horrifying for those of us who are still alive to come face to face with death which is why death the very idea whether it's murder or suicide and i think Grace is absolutely right to say that uh, all suicides can also be seen as murder on the part of the state, uh, but some suicides can also be seen as a certain kind of um, assertive, uh, agential um, action, um, as we see actually in in many cases. So yes, death is multi-pronged and can be read, I think, in multiple ways. Um, but we should not flinch from calling it murder, as Grace did, when that's precisely what it is. And that goes back to the point I was saying, which is that. and segues to the second question which is whether that rights are meant to protect us uh, rights given to us by the state are meant to protect us but really what we need protection from most is the state itself um so who is going to police the police as it were which is a very very pertinent question at this particular moment in time certainly in india um i absolutely think that uh, that there is merit in the critique um uh, uh, of critical legal theories um uh, criticism of uh, of rights i think there's absolute merit to say that um people who are asking for rights are doing it because they feel that their lives are on the line but if we just pause for one minute to think about again this particular moment in the us uh not just the recent george floyd killing but of course the fact that over 80% of people on death row in the us are black men um what has civil rights given the black community in the united states um and so it is one thing to say and with this i completely agree that we need to have protection for all of us against violence from any direction and i do think we all need that protection and we all need to be protected from violence it is another thing to say that the only route to uh, insulating ourselves from violence is the route of rights that i think is a is an extremely is a different position to occupy that i think is a position that we have to critique i don't think that critiquing it is a is a position of privilege if anything not critiquing it allows us to stay in a place that everyone agrees is the right way to go but i actually don't think rights have protected anybody against anything and i would prefer for instance and i've said this before i would prefer for instance a blanket non discrimination policy uh which doesn't allow rights for some and no rights for others um and you can actually use it against to shield yourself against violence in all aspects of life vikram all yours um i i i mean the questions are really uh difficult to answer and and that to answer really quickly so um let me uh let me uh try to say something else uh while i i try to answer these questions and try to answer since both the question in some sense are about the question of desire i would uh, i would therefore just kind of uh, try to answer the question of desire itself now you know i don't know if any of you have actually seen lynching videos um and uh, i mean it's not my favorite thing to do in the world uh, but the lynching video uh, is a particular video in which um again in against the and i'm speaking about say because we're in the moment that we are about uh, 
Muslim folks being lynched by uh, Hindu folks. And what you have, therefore, is an interaction uh, that is uh, performed again uh, as a scene of um, uh, intimacy and so on and so forth that is performed for the camera. So again, unlike the Freudian model of the uh, mummy, daddy and child or the or whatever, the uh, child, father and the Holy Spirit, uh, you have the Hindu Muslim and the camera. Um, and it is a field of both um, both of uh, desire and of pedagogy, as all desire is. Uh, and it is the production, and therefore, what, in some sense, what it does is that it produces a field of both sameness and difference, um, that which is the work of desire itself, uh, and also polices it. You know, when you say, um, when you talk about desire, it pulls you in various direction. Uh, when you think of the police, it pulls you over. Uh, and for me, uh, the pulling over the need to respond to uh, a call by someone in authority uh, is precisely the erotic life of racism and caste. Uh, and it's precisely a principle that is tied to, therefore, uh, police. Uh, so for me, it actually, and we know this from the queer community as well, that desire is actually the most effective kind of police because there is no accountability. Uh, so what you could do is that you can say, I don't like sissies, I don't like trannies, I don't like fat people, I don't like black people, I don't like so on and so forth, and could create a community around you uh, simply because it seems like an inward pull. Um, given its relation to violence, policing, and therefore of immobilizing other forms of people, especially critique, uh, it is actually deeply tied to methods of incarceration. Uh, it is actually incarcerating. Um, and that's quite, uh, and so therefore for me, uh, a right to uh, establish desire, etc., cetera, or a right to marriage is precisely one uh, that ties into these impulses. Uh, it builds communities of desire and desiring and desirous and desirable uh, rather than the undesirable. And the question about life itself is how do we live with the unlivable, not what we desire. And this might be in some sense, I might do say, uh, uh, circa Derrida, but uh, the question really is actually strangely um, the pro the reason why so many Chinese are murdered is precisely desire. That so many people don't know what to do with their desire for Chinese uh, and therefore kill them. And the other thing is that actually unlike an anti-discrimination project, uh, and this might be my disagreement, uh, which ensures the equality of various people in law, uh, which I feel in, then again it, uh, rehabilitates the state and the police as precisely the people who would uh, form these communities. And I'm very afraid of an anti-discrimination law simply because if you give queer people the right to in, uh, incarcerate homophobes, then I know the people that I will find will be Dalit Adivasis and Muslims, precisely because these communities are seen to be homophobic and no white man would ever make it in the world to a prison system precisely because they're still desired. Uh, the reason why Chinese are unfortunately killed is not because we seek equality, it's because we seek freedom. And that's what I was trying to move towards, is that instead of desire as in some sense instituting relations with equality and reciprocity, we might want to think about freedom. It's because precisely no matter how many feminists cry that there is patriarchy, uh, Chinese have the audacity to wear lipstick and saris and take up as much space and speak as loudly as they want to and solicit sex and sex work as they feel free uh, is why we are killed. Uh, so a radical project of queering can only actually, and that's my other thing, must actually think about freedom instead of equality. My only other thing that I would say is that we should be able to build communities even with those we don't desire. And one of the greatest example uh, of building community outside desire is precisely Grace Bano, who is currently with the district collector of Thurikodin building 50 houses, no less, 50 houses for trans women. And they've recently, in no irony to the Hindu state, got some cows that whose milk they'll be selling. Uh, this is a remarkable project of building freedom and life that is in relation to the state that recognizes community and solidarity, but does not actually build it only on relations of sex, desire, and love. Uh, what we have, and this is precisely what is being um, criminalized because the state actually knows that what is most powerful about the trans community is its community. And that is why that is what is being criminalized by the Trafficking Act and the Trans Act. And so I would therefore say that we might want to think about community beyond desire. 
that's my short and therefore abolish desire in order to build community thank you we have time if the panelists agree to for three final questions and i invite ray r rahul sen and akansha sharma to ask their questions can i also ask a question i raised a hand before and couldn't go ahead thank you um i want to ask around care and the politics of care and how care fits in this so for example the i hear like in the family system that i am in i hear a lot of um comments in the garb of care and i wonder if care is selfish and if it, and if it is selfish is it really care um yeah Okay, I'll pose the question on behalf of Ray R. Since they believe, since they're around family and can't be speaking, so their question is: How does our thinking about love, family, desire, and querying them come in the sense of Pariyar and Baba Sahib, Doctor B R Ambedkar's views, say the self-respect movement and marriage? And a final question from Rahul Sen is: How often times the response to my critique of marriage is? but how can you police the desire of those who want to marry is critique also policing and these are directed to all panelists darish why don't you answer some of these questions uh yeah sure um so um as for the question that raised us i think it's it's more an invitation to kind of think back to some of the points that uh, we've already discussed but um and i think maybe just going back to something that i mentioned it so um what does it i mean what does it mean for us to critique um people's desire to marry you know so um where does that fit in with a critique of the normalizing kind of imp- prerogative of marriage so um and and i do think the point that somebody else says about the civilized movement was really kind of important one because um you know i at, if if you look at if you look at the history of the civilized movement if you look at what that movement was kind of trying to capture then there is a kind of transformative potential that it has there so it's i think it's it's very i'm very uncomfortable with kind of dismissing rights claims on that basis because even if you kind of talk about something like a non discrimination policy that's also a rights claim essentially right so i think at at the end of the day um it's it's a little hard to to kind of not have a conversation about rights in that sense so i mean i'm just going to kind of put that out there um as far as the point about policing the desire of those who want to marry being mm, Okay so I I think Rahul with with that question maybe um maybe the comment that was made to you was kind of highly freighted right so they um so you critique marriage and then the person kind of comes back to you and says that's you policing the desire of those who want to marry now that puts a certain kind of burden on you that that doesn't necessarily merit um the position that you speak from right because obviously policing implies a certain kind of state violent position you are not the state you are a person um you know who's kind of just mounting a critique you're, you're engaging in discourse so i mean i just think that that i just think the terms of the question are flawed i, I think we're all engaging in robust critique here critique is not policing in that sense if it comes in this kind of forum at all so yeah i'm just going to Yeah, I mean, if 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 uh, Vikram and Madhavi want to add to that, uh, okay, uh, I'll quickly say something, and then maybe Madhavi can say something. Um, I actually disagree with uh, with Danish that it's not police, as uh, as Turmaline, who's a famous uh, black artist, uh, black trans filmmaker. uh says get the cop out of your head uh that there are actually uh, there is actually great desire when actually uh, there's great desire and great pleasure in policing other people and we don't actually account for that the neighborhood auntie is some kind of fetishized object 
but there is actually great pleasure in policing other people and that's also the function of desire. Uh, and therefore, uh, we might actually, instead of uh, uh, dismissing uh, the police thing, might think about actually what an uh, abolitionist critique looks like. And what an abolitionist critique looks like uh, might be to think about not uh, what at what point does police become the solution by, uh, to a problem, but what the problem really is. And a lot of people who are asking for these kinds of rights are asking them from various kinds of disenfranchised spaces. And so what does it look like to ask for anything else apart from marriage when marriage is the only kind of sanctioned institution? Now, those of us, there are many of us who are happy being mistresses and therefore don't really care for uh, rights and so on and so forth. And I welcome you to that position. There are many queer folks who are happy without a rights-based discourse. But what, what other forms of social infrastructure exist so that critique doesn't become a prison house is a question that we might want to ask. Um, and why does that person feel attacked in that particular way to lead to that might actually be a question of what relation exists between the person who critiques and those who are critiqued. Do they feel that both of you are equal and accountable? Do they feel equally free to accept or reject critique and so on and so forth? And so therefore, much like uh, because a lot of this critique is published in universities where we learn these kinds of things, universities with our silos of privilege, uh, where academic writing that is completely inaccessible uh, to the largest majority produces these forms of knowledge that we accept, you know, Michael Warner, Judith Butler, so on and so forth. Uh, that a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, resentment also comes from precisely our access to these institutions that we don't really account for. My only thing to uh, Jasmine, and I think that's a long conversation, but I think the one thing that we need to think about, uh, especially with care, uh, one thing that I'm learning with uh, is uh, from the uh, the per from persons with disabilities where uh, care, is both, uh, care is both a conversation that is important to have in order to think about ways in which uh, we can abolish desire, but it's also very close to politics of cure. Uh, and so therefore we might want to rethink that. The other thing that I was recently uh, uh, attended, uh, brought, to note, uh, brought to my attention was precisely that care itself is a form of policing. Uh, it is a form uh, of uh, mutuality that is built on unspoken expectations and so on and so forth. So what I really, uh, for me, what is interesting about care is actually its betrayal. And what its betrayal actually reveals to us about our relations. Um, so often we can feel uncared for and abandoned. And I feel like instead of actually uh, putting up a conversation about the labor of care, that makes it sound fluffy, et cetera. What would other bad feelings like envy, resentment, abandonment, uh, uncared forness, callousness, carelessness, et cetera, have to offer to our, uh, our, uh, our sociality or our living together? Um, and so I'm, I'm actually interested in the bad feelings of everything that sounds good, much like love creates uh, envy, jealousy, abandonment, and so on and so forth. And I want to build a world from there in order to actually confront what leads us to love, what leads us to care might actually be, uh, for me, a far more productive conversation. I'll stop there so that Madhavi can say something. Um, just very quickly, just a couple of things. Uh, thanks, Danish and, and Vikram. Um, just a couple of things, Danish. Uh, absolutely, I don't think we should be looking to the law or the police or the state to um, sanction our desires in any way. Uh, but I think the advantage that a non-discrimination blanket has over a rights discourse is that non-discrimination does not actually have to define who it is seeking a right against. So in fact, if you just have non-discrimination, there is nobody who you're saying, I'm going to shut the door behind me, and they're going to be outside the door. So for instance, in the US, if gay marriage happens, it happens at the expense of the immigrant. Here, if gay marriage happens, it happens at the expense of you know, a lot of, of inter-caste marriage, inter-religious marriage. It always, rights always have to exist at the expense of X. 
Um, and so the slight advantage that non-discrimination might have is that they will never have to specify what the X or Y or Z is because there is no room and scope for that kind of categorization. Um, I think um, sort of going to Rahul's question and Vikram's response and Danish's response actually, um, I absolutely think critique is essential and conversation is essential and I don't think we should be policing um, uh, thought and, and expression and conversation and, and I think this forum is an excellent example of that. All I will say about desire is that it is not something that automatically leads only to good things. In fact, it often leads to very, very bad things. And so in that sense, it is not the opposite of undesire. It is not the opposite of ugliness. It is not the opposite of envy or resentment. All of that is, con that all of that is contained within the project of desire. So desire is not liberatory. Uh, like rights, it's not going to set us free. And if we don't assume that it is going to set us free, we won't in fact need to abolish it or embrace it or anything of the kind. If we in fact acknowledge what it might do or not do for us, depending on certain contexts and occasions, I think it can be a very powerful heuristic, uh, particularly because unlike rights, um, it cannot be defined. And my problem with rights is that it always has to carve out a niche for itself. Uh, the strength of desire, to my mind, is that it can never actually be pinned down. It is not separable from envy. It is not separable from, uh, from hatred. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the truly chilling things I think we're seeing politically in the country today is the more gains that are being made by the right wing, the angrier it is making them. And so this kind of, oh, I have got what I desire, therefore I should be happy, is absolutely a myth. The fulfillment of desire does not, it can cause much more resentment, much more hatred, and certainly politically around us, alas, that's what we're seeing. Thank you. Uh, Survi, Survi, just quickly, I'm sorry, I want to answer Ray's mm -hmm. question really quickly, uh, just to say something about to Ray. One is belated happy birthday, my love. Uh, second uh, is that I'm really sorry that you're incarcerated with your stupid family. Uh, and third uh, is that I would see that the kinds of marriages that Baba Sahib and Periyar advocate are still socially illegal in this country. Every honor killing is testament to the fact that the actual project of queering marriage was actually begun by Dr. Ambedkar. The actual conversations in the Hindu court bill as a testimony to the fact about how Dr. Ambedkar did not believe that desire is some liberatory thing, uh, and how Dr. Ambedkar believed uh, in uh, the law's transformative potential, but only in building and precisely in so far as the social movement could carry it. Remember the social and political in Dr. Ambedkar's famous constituent assembly debate. So I would say that unfortunately, the queer marriage project, as done by Menika Guruswami, Arandati Kadju, and others, is not interested in that project at all, uh, and since they are so much interested in respectable queers. But we know that as part of our project of solidarity and so on and so forth, it is precisely a project against love jihad, against honor killings and so on, and the social illegalities around that. Uh, and so I would say that the project of queering was actually begun by Dr. Ambedkar, by Savitri Bhai Phule, whose beautiful letters could be anyone's queer letters. And, uh, and actually, actually, we shouldn't call them queer because queer itself is a Savarna thing, but actually where the feminist project of rethinking marriage really began. And it's in the, in the long trajectory of which we are having this conversation. So I'm so grateful that you raised their names. And I'm so grateful for your existence and happy birthday. Thank you to all panelists. Um, Dr. Akkai, if you're still on the chat, if, if you're here, we have one, we'll take one final question. Um, this is by Abhilasha Jain, who wants to ask, what does queering mean if, as pointed out, it is a horizon? Is it only about adding sexual minorities to the discourse? What about queer? What does queer mean without it becoming only about sexual orientation? Is it about queering our ways of relating to vulnerabilities? I think. Um, Akka, if you're here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hello. I think um, the word queering is not or shall not be restricted to this movement of sexual minorities. I think any terminology has to be a sort of broader liberal you know like inclusion when i say this i think yes the issues of or the politics of sexuality and gender is a discourse that needs to happen across sections across movements across societies and across states you know if that's so i think yes 
I think queering is not only restricted to the LGBTIQ or plus. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the word is also politically quite important. Whether is it queering or is it sexual minorities or it is MSMTG, I think is each end of these terminologies in the working class movement, we don't use queering, we use sexual minorities. We use intergender, we use intersex, you know. I think that with all of this is the thing that what we are, you know, as a movement, we are trying to bring up differences with one umbrella and finally agitating against all sorts of odds for, you know, just to lead our life with dignity. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Akai, and to all the panelists. I now ask Shruti to propose a vote of thanks to all of you. Shruti. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. This was a truly thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I was telling Survey earlier how I spent like an inordinate amount of time this week just building YouTube videos of each and every panelist. And so this was like a very long fangirling moment for me. So um, I'm sure I don't speak just for myself when I say that this, as uh, Mr. Sheikh puts it, was an invitation to thinking about whether we do want to surrender our love and desire to the validation of the state. And uh, so on behalf of the NLS Feminist Alliance, I would like to thank each and every panelist for taking out time for the, from their busy schedule to actually uh, throw some light on this rather gray area. And I hope, we hope that we could continue interacting with you and hosting you in some capacity or the other in the future as well. Further, this event would truly not have been possible without the support and efforts of many other people. To begin with, the NLSIU administration and particularly the IT department and the IT staff, who not only helped us set up this platform, but also were extremely responsive to our requests, our clarifications, and our tech-related doubts. And further, all the audience and uh, participants who kept excellent questions coming in, which definitely contributed to the quality of this discussion today. Uh, Chirayu Jen for incessantly just supporting the NLS Fem Feminist Alliance throughout. And lastly, the NLS Fem Feminist Alliance team, who worked was looking forward eagerly to this event and has been working for over a month and a half over this i would like to give a special shout out to the senior members of the alliance Urti, rishika and mansvini who have graduated in june but they continue to extend their support their guidance and their recommendations and we definitely couldn't have pulled this out without them so thank you to each one of you this is a wonderful event Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Thank you people. Thanks.